So Jenlin created in his research something called the experiencing scale. And I use this, we use it in our model a lot in terms of assessing clients. It's a way of uh, noting where people are in terms of their capacity to go deeply down into felt sensing and into a felt shift. So we rate people in the assessment, the, I call it the embodied assessment and treatment tool. We'll just touch on it briefly here today, later on. So it starts with just the client simply tells you some events. So a client comes in and they talk to you. They don't go down into something and pause. They're just, they want to tell, kind of bring you up to date. That's kind of a level one. When they refer to themselves, but without much emotion, but they're referring to themselves, it moves into a two because they're coming into themselves. Then they can express emotion, but only as it kind of relates to these external circumstances. And some people kind of get stuck here, right? It's hard for them to go deeper into themselves. And by level four, people are connecting directly with their emotions and their thoughts about themselves. And you can see this in therapy when clients are more able to be in presence with themselves. They know what they think. They know what they feel. They're here. Then when you teach them to focus and to pause, they begin to sense into and explore more of their inner world, their inner experiencing. And that moves into touching into a whole felt sense experience. By level six, there's this awareness of deep experiencing and meaning. And often this is where a shift, a felt shift will occur. And then by seven, there's a really deep self-understanding and a sense of deep connection with self and with the world, with the universe. This is often a spiritual place. This was the first model that I made many, many years ago. I didn't know about the ANS back then, autonomic nervous system, but I did know about numbing and flooding. So you can see this on the left, this flooding state of trauma and on the, or sorry, on the right. And on the left, the, the dissociated branch, which now we would call the dorsal branch of the vagus, which we didn't have that name for back then. And the yellow is me sitting there in the middle between um, often a couple where one person's in one sympathetic state and the other person is in a dorsal state and they're in a power struggle, right? So we've talked about these moments of movement, this felt shift. And what I, what I was amazed by when I was writing my book, I went doing a lot of research. I found that Jenlin actually had done some studies uh, of the autonomic nervous system. So he was picking up on this physical release and the shift in the body and curious about what was going on there. He actually even uh, studied heart rate variability, which is Steve Gorgeous, um, one of his main uh, measures of, of research. So I was very excited by that. So the model is based on five different theories um, because I got curious and went uh, exploring over, you know, four decades or so. Um, we've talked about the feminist trauma-informed theory that we started with, beautiful work back then, and still these people are uh, publishing, amazing, and teaching. Check them out if you don't know them already. Um, and then I found uh, focusing. And then I found interpersonal neurobiology, uh, Dan Siegel's work, uh, wonderful work. And I was very drawn to it because he gave us a way at Bonnie Badenoch um, of bringing in neurophysiology into our understanding, our psychological understanding with clients. And it just seemed to me that this was so important because, you know, after all, we are biological beings as well. And we want to have this whole integrated um, model to be able to understand people. Then I went searching for a way of understanding addiction that wasn't linked or wasn't seen through the lens of pathology. Um, and I found um, Mark Lewis's work on uh, the biology of, uh, of desire. And he created a learning model of addiction 
which really, I think, updates the way we understand addiction and brings in uh, neuroplasticity. And we really needed this um, to help us to become much more sophisticated in terms of how we understand addiction works. Uh, and then, of course, polyvagal theory and Steve Porges and Deb Dana's work. So this was the second model that really integrates, as you can see, a lot more of interpersonal neurobiology, um, the uh, sympathetic branch that um, Siegel calls chaos, and the um, dorsal branch that he calls rigidity and shutting down. And then I added addiction into that. Um, which we'll see more of in polyvagal. So, of course, uh, Siegel talked a lot about attachment theory, <clears throat> very important in terms of understanding how uh, we are formed, right, in early in life. And what I did is I brought in the um, uh, autonomic nervous system and related it to these different attachment styles. So... You see here how secure attachment, we call it the safe nest, is the grounded place in the nervous system that we call the ventral branch of the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is this long cranial nerve, the longest one, that goes from the base of our brain, the brain stem, right down into our gut. And it carries all this information up into our brain stem about what's happening in our body. So when we feel safe enough, the ventral branch of the vagus above the diaphragm is activated. And here, baby feels safe and secure. And then for babies who grow up in um, uh, environments where uh, caretakers are more in that sympathetic response of flight fight that we talked about, you get these different styles, according to Siegel, of an insecure avoidant holding baby too far away, and also this kind of ambivalent attachment, which is really unpredictable. So baby is either held too close or too far away. And so there's this sense of not being able to predict a kind of secure, safe space inside, in the body. And this, of course, shapes us over time. And then the last uh, style of attachment that Siegel did a lot of work on, um, they called disorganized attachment. And this is the place where the caretaker is either really terrifying through raging or terrified and shutting down in a dorsal state in the, in the body. And so there is really no one there to be present, fully present for baby. And then of course, this whole way of understanding attachment is being um, um, enhanced to bring in how society greets and holds a connection with um, marginalized groups, for example, where you never have a secure attachment outside perhaps of the home that you live in. This has a huge impact on people. The window of tolerance is Siegel's work here. And so we see how in these hyper aroused states of insecure attachment, the fight flight place, it's outside of this window of tolerance, he calls a place where we can feel grounded inside. And the hypo arousal, the dorsal branch of shutting down in the vagus is also this place where we go when we feel this threat. So our job as therapists is to help our clients expand their capacity to stay grounded in environments that can trigger hyperarousal and hypoarousal. And we do this through working through the trauma and teaching people how to find more grounded ventral places in the body. Sorry, there we go. Um, this is an example of a brain in an fMRI scanner. And you see Uta's brain on the right 
this is what her brain looks like when she's recalling um, being in a car accident. And she, her brain has gone into this folding and shut down place in the nervous system. And her husband, Stan, went to a sympathetic place. And you can see what it looks like and how different it is. And how it's really important to take this in to understand what happens in our bodies with trauma and how we need to really pay attention to this when we're working with clients.